Back Ryan at Expedition 44. Today I'm going to take a look at two subjects that a lot of people ask me about, which are the Nephilim and the Flood. I get a lot of emails, text messages, comments on videos, things like that, asking me about what I think about different subjects. And these two are probably number one. And as I have alluded to several beliefs maybe that I have in these areas, I haven't made a film specifically about them until today. So today I'm going to seek to answer some of those questions a lot of people have asked. Now to start this, I need to preface this by saying something that I say regularly in these videos. Not everybody is a big fan of this, but the Bible is not a science book. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't have true science or that the things that it talks about don't line up with scientific research and evidence today. That's not what I'm saying when I say that. I say that the goal of the Bible is a love story. It's about showing a relational God and the message that he wants to bring to the readers of this narrative on the entire history and the future of what we have in him. So when I say this, I mean that when the Bible describes historical things, it's not seeking to be a history book or a science book. It's seeking to be less empirical and more theological. And so as I go through this today, I'm going to talk about those things in some different ways and kind of open the door for different thinking. Now, with that said, I'm going to remind you that I've graduated from a couple of very conservative Bible schools. And sometimes when people hear things that I say and how I say them, they wonder about them because they've never heard it put this way before. And I'm going to, again, kind of invite you to take a very simplistic view of the scripture and say, let's read it, let's approach it like you haven't been influenced by the Americanized worldview of thinking about it. Let's read it more like we're reading it for the first time, taking into account what the people that it was written to at the time would have thought or been influenced in order to read it the way that they received it. That being said, I am a full believer that the Bible was written both for the time that it was written to certain groups of people, but it's also applicable 100% to us today. And it came about when mankind began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and they were beautiful, and they took for themselves wives from any they chose. And Yahweh said, My spirit will not remain with man indefinitely, and that he is flesh, his days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, whenever the sons of God went into the daughters of men who bore to them children, they were the mighty men of antiquity, men of renown. We have a couple of things here. We have sons of God, which is B'nai HaElohim, and then we also have it kind of referred to maybe at the same time as the Nephilim. And so what are we doing with that? Typically, when we hear the term sons of God in the Old Testament, originally that was a term that was a kind of applied to anything that was directly created by the hand of God. So you might put spiritual beings in there, Adam and Eve. If your theology falls that Adam and Eve were the first priests and that there are other men and women created, you would group them into that. Now you have the Nephilim, and there's a lot to be said in names, and so that name kind of refers to the fallen. And so if you take that name, what is it? Well, it's probably a reference to fallen spiritual beings that are going to come down to earth and go in there. So why do we call them men of antiquity or men of renown? It was a way of the Old Testament of saying that they were well known for who they were. And later we hear a reference kind of called giants. So we see that they were great people within the years. And most of us know that Goliath, who David faced, was probably referred to as one of those Nephilim. And he had brothers. And that might have been when David picked up several stones out of the brook that he wasn't just going to kill uh, Goliath, that he was also going over the other Nephilim because they kind of became subjects of Canaanites and Israel was supposed to completely conquer them. And then there's also another play in this of God conquering those fallen spiritual beings that were kind of coming down and taking the form of evil beings. And so there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on, kind of filling the puzzle together. And so we look at that and that is the best understanding of how we put the Nephilim together with the sons of God and make sense out of it. Now, theologically, what I'm describing is called the fallen angel view of theology. And there's a couple other views. You have the Sethite view and you have the royalty view. And I'm not going to get too into those because I don't really fall that way. And it's okay if you do. But really, when it comes down to it, it doesn't really matter much when we're putting this together. That's, that's who the Nephilim were. And some people kind of 
look at this and they use maybe Luke 24 as saying, I'm not sure that's what it meant, but I don't really have a problem with Luke 24 going that way. There is all kinds of references that spiritual beings took fleshly form and you see that throughout the Bible and it just seems to make sense. And you put that with Jude 4 and 2 Peter 2 and it's hard to argue the fallen angel view if you want to call it that way. I don't really like to call them angels, but if I say that you kind of know what I'm talking about. This kind of starts with the Deuteronomy 32 worldview that it's a dual fall. Not only do Adam and Eve fall, but you have spiritual entities falling as well and they continue to fall um, until finally where we read in Revelations that a third of all the spiritual beings are going to fall. And so when you take that view and you see that they're falling and then they're taking on that fleshly form, which I've alluded to, you see several times throughout the scripture, and then they are getting together with the women of the earth and producing these giants. Why do I take that view? Well, some people would say that, you know, maybe they're they're not supernatural and that, you know, I've heard people even say maybe Noah was one of them when they try to source the flood out. I don't believe that because if you take human people and put them together, they make regular human people. And so in this case, when we have the Nephilim, we have, we have spiritual entities with women of earth, and then we get Nephilim giant babies. And so that's one of the reasons why I put it that way. There's, there's several ones besides that too. It's also mentioned in some extra biblical sources, and I don't really like to, I, I think we can do this just from the Bible, but definitely if you look at the book of Enoch, that kind of comes into play, and a lot of people don't like to do that. And I, I can understand the um, kind of hesitancy to look at extra biblical sources. There's some really good ones, and there's some really bad ones. And so one of the things in the Nephilim that you're going to see is that when we read about them, they're around before the flood and after the flood. And so there's a lot of repercussions that you have to put together between the flood and the Nephilim in order for this to work out and fix itself together. And so we're going to kind of take a look at that. And most people view the flood as a global flood, especially within the more evangelical circles. So it's kind of describing this cleansing of the earth mentality. But then after that, we see that the Nephilim are still there. And so that raises the question, was this a global flood or was it a local flood? Did the Nephilim survive the flood or what happens? Theologically, how do you put those pieces of the puzzle together to make sense out of all of this? So again, if you're going to take the local view of the flood, that would mean that you believe that it just covered a portion of the area and that when it happened, it might not have completely covered the mountains or all of the earth and just part of it. And then obviously the global one is, as you would believe, it covered the entire earth and everything. Now, I don't get hung up in this. I actually think there's great support for both sides of the fence here. And so I have some really good theological friends that go both ways on this one. I tend to be a literal flood guy. And so I look at that and I just think that it lines up better. But some of the best evangelical and Christian theologians in the world actually take the local view on this. And I won't be surprised if I get to heaven and, you know, God says, oh, you know what? You were a little off on that one. I'll look at it and go, uh, if I would have had a little more information, I would have gotten there. And it's one of those things that if you just look at the Bible, I just don't think we have quite as much information as we need to make a definitive decision on that. So let me explain to you a couple reasons why I think that. So considering a local flood, most of the Jewish historians and people of that period would have thought that way. So you see this in the writing of Philo and Josephus, and most Jewish rabbis still would take this view today. In order to do that, the word that we interpret as earth has to get kind of retranslated to land. Is that a bad translation? No, it's translated that way enough other times in the Bible that that's not really problematic to me. But to me, the reason why I tend to go universal here is because it mentions it in Genesis 6 through 11 about 30 times. And I would argue that all of it has kind of a universal feel to it. That if I was just telling somebody about the flood, the way that it describes it feels universal, not local. Now, it is true to the other side that that's the only world they knew of. So when it, what they could be describing as their entire world might have been a very small part of the globe that we know now exists. 
So there's a couple other considerations. One of them is Noah's told to save animals, two of each, maybe seven of each. Why would he be asked to save all of those if some of the animals, or maybe even most of the animals, could have survived in a non-local flood? Well, it might be that they were provided for food because we know before that uh, they were vegetarians and after that they started eating meat, so maybe it was for that. But he saved a lot of animals that they still would not have eaten, so that doesn't necessarily make sense. Another thing is that God says he's going to destroy everyone. If he didn't destroy everyone, if the Nephilim would have made it through the flood, then this wouldn't really seem possible, especially if they were ones that the flood was about judgment and these were ones that he was going to judge. But there's some answers to that, so we'll get there in a second. Then you have worldwide fossils within the rock. And I think that there's a lot of truth to this, that this suggests a major global flood. But again, you know, you could come up with some ideas that might argue this a different way to be more local too. But there are several other references in the Bible. I think when we read Peter and Jesus that their idea of this flood seems to be global too. So when I'm taking all this into account, I'm kind of open to the local idea, but I just read the Bible as if I were sitting down and reading it and said, what does that sound like? It sounds to me like it's a global flood. And the biggest place that people have a problem with why they would want to turn it into a local flood instead of a global flood often hinges around the fact that the Nephilim were present before the flood and after the flood. So what are the answers to this mystery? So there's a few different views on how they survived this and some of these get a little bit out there so you're just going to have to kind of listen and source out your own thoughts. But one view that I've heard that I'm going to kind of say is perhaps the weakest is that Noah may have been partly a Nephilim. And I kind of throw that out because it just doesn't really make sense to me. If God is trying to get rid of this evilness of the earth, I just can't see Noah being part of that. So that's kind of all I'm going to say there. Another kind of more um, abstract one is you might remember when uh, Peter takes some of the disciples up to the Bashan area and he takes Peter and, and kind of looks out there and they, they're overlooking this thing and it's kind of was said to be like a bottomless pit and Jesus was talking about overcoming the spirits that they, they would be, once he dies on the cross, they're going to be shackled, let's say. And so some people would believe that as part of the flood was brought upon God, by God to be supernaturally, that in a similar supernatural power that the the, the grounds may have been opened and the Nephilim might have escaped through there. And so that's where you see Jesus going to the Bashan area, kind of looking at that and saying, I'm going to overcome this, that it's not going to continue. So it's an interesting idea. I don't really fall in line with it much. The one that I tend to go with more is that if the Nephilim were doing what they were doing before the flood, meaning according to their name, fallen, coming down and intermixing with women of earth, what's to say that that didn't continue after the flood, especially when we read in Revelations where the angels falling seems to kind of be this continual idea. And so that would probably be the view that to me makes the most sense. The important thing when we take all of this in is that we're open to where God is leading our heart and our mind. And as we explore these topics, I hope that it brings you closer to the character of God and your understanding of what his message is to a broken world and how he wants to get us back into this wonderful relationship with him that started in Eden and ends in a very similar way. He loves us and he wants to have a deep relationship with us. May God bless you.